Hello, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're going to move straight on to the next panel. Uh, we're going to be talking for the next hour or so about translating classics. We may at some point have to deal with the question of what we mean by classics, uh, or indeed what we mean by translating, but we possibly won't go there. Uh, my name is Daniel Hahn. I'm the National Programme Director of the British Centre for Literary Translation, and I'm joined on stage by uh, Patrick McGuinness, by John Siciliano, Alexandre Koch, and Oliver Reddy. Um, they all have different uh, parts to play in the process of selecting books for translation and publishing uh, translations, and indeed translating translations. Um, we will talk a little bit about the work they do, we'll talk a bit about the subject, and we're going to leave plenty of time for you to ask questions uh, at the end, so do please uh, start thinking of really awkward questions <laughs> for, obviously not for me, but for them, as awkward as you like. Um, just a very brief introduction before we get started at the far end over there. Um, Patrick McGuinness, who's a professor of French at Oxford. He's a novelist who's been long listed for the Booker. He's a poet and he's a translator of poetry, uh, including uh, Malarmé, including a somewhat neglected Romanian poet called Liviu Campanu, of whom I'm sure we're going to be talking. To his left, John Siciliano is the executive, I was going to say executive editor of Penguin. It's Peng your Penguin Random House now, aren't you? Yeah. Are you officially the, is the executive editor at Penguin Random House? It's a whole new thing um, in the US where he publishes across uh, a number of lists, including commissioning for Penguin Classics. To John's immediate left, Alexandra Koch, who is the editor in chief of Schwab, <laughs> who, is, who is here with me. I get a little mascot. I'll just kind of pat him on the head every once in a while, um, which is based at the Dutch Foundation for Literature in Amsterdam, and she'll tell us a little bit about what that organization does. Um, and to my immediate right, Oliver Reddy, who's a research fellow at St. Anthony's College, Oxford. Um, he has just translated, retranslated Crime and Punishment, which has been published in the UK on the Penguin Classics list, which is an extraordinarily foolish thing to have agreed to translate, I would have thought, and I shall be asking you what possessed you uh, to agree to such a thing. That's a very, very brave undertaking, I would have thought. Um, he's also the consultant editor for Russia and um, East and Central Europe at the Times Literary Supplement. I'm going to start by asking John, I think, um, about sort of the beginning of the process and about the, the selection, the you don't acquire classics, I suppose, in the same way that you acquire any other book. So can you say something maybe to begin with about the decision to publish a classic, the decision to, in many cases, retranslate a classic? Uh, yeah, I mean, there are, there are various uh, considerations and book projects come about in different ways. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, well, my main interest uh, for the Penguin Classics is in identifying uh, areas of growth and um, uh, languages and countries and writers that we don't have represented on the list um, to introduce a new dimension and to kind of enlarge the canon um, and to uh, kind of shine a light on, on uh, previously unrecognized authors um, by allowing them to share the stage with, you know, quite well-known authors. Um, uh, so a lot of the books that I um, commission um, are firsts for the list. Uh, I came to Penguin Classics eight years ago um, aware of its strength in American literature and British literature and Western European literature. Um, and then coming to discover that it had considerable strengths in other areas too, but they weren't conspicuous to me. Um, and then I began to s notice some opportunities um, and some gaps. Um, so in the last few years, we've come to publish our first Yiddish classic, our first modern Japanese classic, our first modern Chinese classic, uh, just a couple months ago, we published our first Turkish classic. Um, so one way is to look at the map and figure out, you know, who are the authors in these parts of the world that could be considered classics. And it's a matter of asking 
a lot of questions and meeting people and talking to scholars and talking to translators and you know um, and kind of crowdsourcing um, information. Um, another another approach is to uh, kind of rediscover an author or reinvigorate an author. So uh, just last night I was at a dinner uh, uh, as part of a series called Club Simenon. Um, Penguin has uh, in both the UK and the US um, embarked on a massive uh, retranslation program of the works of Georges Simenon will be publishing. It's like a hundred books or something. About a hundred right? books of his. Um, you know, and one way to kind of shine a, shine a light on an author that people have, may have heard of but don't quite know is to, you know, um, produce new translations, publish new translations of his work um, or her work. Um, and is that also something which you think these books need? I mean, a lot of people in this room will have read in a translation the big Russian 19th century novels. They will have read the big French 19th century novels, yeah. but they will have read them... I, I mean, I happen to, I, because of, I'm exactly the age I am, and therefore I read Tolstoy through Rosemary Edmonds, and other people read Tolstoy through Constance Garnett if it was before or someone else if it was later. Yeah. Do you feel that part of your job then is the need to, um, every, I don't know, generation or two generations or every decade, to l look again at these people and go, we're going to need another Madame Bovary, we're going to need another Quixote, we're going to yeah. need to, to it's give a, them a fresh, yeah. a fresh translation? It's a combination of uh, a need and opportunity. Um, you know, I don't think anybody needs a new translation of Madame Bovary. And when I published, oh come now! <laughs> Does anyone I here think that you can have too many translations of? It's a slightly biased audience of a room full of translators. Yeah. This yeah. I think we, everyone here wants to do their own Madame Bovary. I'm yeah. guessing. Right there we go. Right. Well, I you know I published Talk a new. Talk to him afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> I published a new translation of Madame Bovary a few years ago, Lydia Davis's translation, and you know, at, at the Th time that'll do actually. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. It's I mean, not that, a bad start. That kind of speaks for itself. Um, uh, but you know, and, and, and then a third way is to um, identify something that's uh, a shortcoming in an existing translation. For example, I uh, last year published um, a new translation of D'Annunzio's Il Piacere. And there had been only one other English translation um, more than a hundred years ago, and that was, you know, published. In, it was a Victorian era translation that was a, a bowlerization of the novel. It, it was a novel famous for its sex and didn't have any sex in it. So this is a translation that put the sex back in pleasure, as it were. Um, so yeah, those are three examples. Alexandra, you, the first thing that John mentioned was filling in the gap. So it's, it's discovering the things that should be recognized as classics and may be recognized as classics in some places, but the English-speaking world, because we are somewhat stupid about such things, we may have missed them. Can you say a little bit about Schwab? Because the point, as I understand it, of the organization is precisely that, is to find ways of, of making things that are or should be classics travel. Um, well, it, it should make them travel, but um, Maybe first, Van Van, I'm, I'm working at the Dutch Foundation for Literature, but um, we are not the only found, um, institution in, behind Schwab. Van Van, there are right now seven uh, foundations for literature from working on this project. And as you might know, Van Van, the most foundations are working on promoting their national literature abroad. Van Van, is, um, that's what most of them do here um, on the book fairs. Fun, fun. And um, this project is actually to, to turn this process around and to find literature from anywhere else fun, and to bring it home to the publishers in the country where we are settled. And we also, of course, talk to publishing houses from other countries, fun, fun, but that is really the, the idea behind that. Fun. So we are looking for the for the lost, for the, for the forgotten modern classics. Fun, fun, um, of books from the 20th century that we don't know, in my case, yet in the Netherlands. And I'm trying to find those titles that haven't been translated yet or that have been translated for the last time 50 years ago yeah. and um, trying to find a publishing house for that. And when they publish it, for not this, we are um, also helping with promoting that book to readers. So could you tell me the, your question again? For not this, um, well, the, the <laughs> it, there are English language publishers uh -huh. all, all over the world who need quite a lot of 
help, I think, to discover things that are not being pushed at them as the front list titles every day. I suspect that most publishers, British American publishers, the book fair, are having lots of meetings where people are telling them about something which came out on Wednesday mm -hmm. or something which is coming yeah. out next Tuesday. But relatively rarely, I imagine, John, it may be slightly different for you because people know that you have a classics list, but on the whole, people are not going to be going to meetings with publishers saying there is this fantastic late 19th century novel. Mm or even mid 20th century novel. So the so your role is partly going to be helping these publishers to to find the things that are not absolutely in front of them yeah, otherwise. Yeah, to get them back into the picture again because of course I'm I mean a, as an author when you're alive you can you can lobby for your own book but if you're dead fun fun you can't fun fun so <laughs> and very often you have a translator or several translators fun fun doing that for you but um, well this project is also to help translators in that fun fun because as a publisher you might also think, well, this translator has a commercial interest in, in um, having this, and this could make it like the, the pleat a little stronger, fun, fun, as we don't have a commercial interest. Mm. Um, so if translators tell us about titles, fun, fun, we can take them into the list, tell publishing houses about that, and yeah. The, the, that process of publishers finding things and deciding what to do, John mentioned when he was talking about the different ways things happen, he said that you have lots of conversations with people, um, and it'll be with other publishers and with scholars, and you also mentioned translators. Um, and I'm presuming and I'm fervently hoping um, that the role of the translator, um, generally the role of the professional translators, can be partly in that conversation and helping write, uh, publishers to discover things and to make uh, decisions to inform publishers and to um, lobby if required um, to get publishers to do the things that they may not necessarily realize yet they want to do. Um, maybe this is a good time to ask Oliver to ask you about how how your Dostoevsky came about in that case. So I, as a translator I'd previously always translated <clears throat> writers who hadn't been translated before, so the Dostoevsky, Crime and Punishment, uh, the idea did not come from me, but John, from one of your colleagues at Penguin Classics. Um, I think it came probably about two years after I'd been going around saying we shouldn't be retranslating the classics. <laughs> um, but um, yes, the, the, the novel begins with Raskolnikov, and there's a certain phrase in Russian, as if in two minds. And I think I, said, I spent a lot of time as if in two minds. Probably I knew that I would say yes, but I, it took me some time to convince myself and say yes. Why did we, to convince you're playing, myself? You're playing hard was, to get. Well, no, no, oh, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> um, and as, as you said, perhaps it was brave, perhaps it was foolish. Um, in both cases, it was probably quite good to be ignorant of the previous translations to a large degree. Mm. I didn't study haven't read any of the translations from beginning to end. Um, but what helped me decide that I did want to do it was closely studying different translations of the first chapter, which is just the first six or seven pages, uh, which plunges us into this heat wave in Petersburg and into the contradictory thoughts of Dostoevsky's hero, and which is formidably difficult to translate. And so comparing existing translations made me feel, well, A, how different the ones that exist are, and secondly, how obvious the shortcomings were in many, in many cases. So, it felt that there was something to aim for. Um, so I remember that being the early stage. But as, as the work went on, I found plenty of reasons why I wanted to do this very much. Mm. And w one of those is uh, that we normally think of Dostoevsky as a, um, a writer of great intensity, of, a writer of ideas, and very rarely as a, as a master of language and even you know, his most in influential interpreter, Bakhtin, doesn't really study Dostoevsky's use of individual mm. words and of repetitions and of echoes. And that's really what one of the things I've focused on in, in my work as a translator, uh, because the novel itself teaches you how to read it. I'm sure many of you have read it, and some of the best scenes in the novel are those between a detective and the murderer, in which the detective is keeps drawing attention to Raskolnikov's use of language and saying behind every word there is another word. You know, like all of your language is ambiguous or ambivalent or has even more than two meanings. And that's a clue to the reader and a clue to the translator as well of, of the whole novel and Dostoevsky's use of language throughout the novel and trying to capture the uh, linguistic intricacy of it is, is something that I don't, I don't think 
translators have really spoken about and even critics have really much written about when it comes to Dostoevsky. So it was fun in the sense that it was a voyage of discovery in that sense. And I think that any translation to be, especially if you're going to live with it for five years, you mm. need to be discovering things. Otherwise, it would be a hell, I think. You have the... I was going to say disadvantage, though some translators would consider it an advantage that your author has been dead for quite a long time. Um, some of us have wished such things on our authors, but it doesn't <laughs> always happen, um, which is sometimes a shame. Uh, presumably, there are certain things that are different because you have, as you said, access to these previous translations, even if you didn't have recourse to them yourself. What you don't have is an author on the end of email who can answer questions, an author who can have opinions. You didn't have that sort of... I'm presuming, unless there's something really weird happening. In he, he, was, he was briefly interested in spiritualism, Dostoevsky. There was a, there was a craze. So. So, well, in that case, so, so he is there. was he looking over your shoulder then? <laughs> yeah, there's a strong sense of... Did it, what, uh, what would he... You were telling me earlier that he was... A, I didn't know that he was a translator. Uh, His first early. publication, Dostoevsky's first entry into St. Petersburg literary life was as a translator of Balzac. Of so, what would, so what would he have made of, what, of this strange thing you've done to his book? Um... I think it's easy to imagine his disapproval of how long it took me because he wrote that he translated Eugenie Grandet during his holidays. Um, <laughs> secondly, given, given his obsession God. with originality and how Russian intellectuals of the time were plagiarizing other people's ideas, he probably wouldn't have been too pleased about the fact that this was a 12th, 13th or 14th translation of the same novel. But, <clears throat> but it's fascinating to wonder how, if, if, if Dostoevsky subjected his, his translators to the same forensic scrutiny that his characters are subjected to what he would what he would think uh, I hope uh, um, I hope that he would approve of this this idea of the translator as detective which is something that has sort of occurred to me after I finished the novel but when I think back on it that is how I felt while I was doing it picking up these little clues seeded through the text um, and well his main aesthetic principle as a writer apart from that was was energy at all costs and dynamism, vitality. And uh, I was trying, translations of Dostoevsky have often been criticized for sort of sagging, that mm. there are a lot of secondary, I mean, Crime and Punishment is, it begins with a very intense first part, then it turns into a sort of, in some ways, a more conventional 19th century novel with a lot of secondary characters. Um, one thing I was trying to do was to show how rich the speech of these secondary characters and humor is, and um, to bring to bring that, to bring the characters in the background who come to the foreground later in the novel alive as much as possible. Thank you. Patrick, I, I, I'm gonna, I'll ask you in a moment about your, your translations, but actually I want to ask a slightly more general question which relates to, to what Oliver was saying and specifically to what he was saying about what Dostoevsky, um, about the, the 12 or 13 Dostoevsky. Is there an argument for not translating and retranslating and retranslating? I ask you as someone who has been known to translate Yes. Is there yes. an argument for, for leaving these things alone? We've got a decent translation and now we do something else. Yeah, well, I, I'm in two minds. Well, I'm, I'm in two minds about most things anyway, because I find that's the minimum number of minds <laughs> required to produce <laughs> ideas that are interesting. But I suppose I do have a feeling about, um, about, about the classics, that they're kind of an encumbrance, you know, that they, that they clog up the system, as it were. Mm. Um, on the other hand, I... In, in, my own, in my own work as a translator, I've always looked for the gaps, the gappy stuff, the, the stuff that's on the margins or that's temporarily forgotten um, to the extent that I've, I've only ever really done things that have either never appeared before or have appeared in, in fragmentary form. But of course, I, I rely a great deal on the classics um, in translation in order to orientate myself and to know where the gaps are. So there's a kind of mutual kind of dependence there that you can't, you can't understand what lies in the margins unless you've got a sense of the center. So in that sense, a constant feed of, of classics that have been invigorated and retranslated is incredibly mm. useful. But for me, they're, they're more like um, jumping off points. And, um, but presumably there's a difference, even if it's for example, a writer who has been translated but not this particular text. There is a difference between translating someone who we'll talk about Campagna, I think, in a moment, um, but also between someone like that who doesn't have a voice in English uh, until you give him a voice in English and someone like Mallarmé 
for whom some people have people will have some sense of what this is supposed to sound like, even if you're yeah. translating things that aren't familiar. People have there is a certain kind of context into which you are translating somebody who who has a name already. Yes, that, that that's right, and um, I suppose it's true of poetry more possibly than prose because yeah. there's a kind of um, a sort of big engine of expectation that poetry generates especially among the few people in Britain who read poetry and translation, that, that kind of tells you how you have to translate it anyway. Um, I did translate some Malarmé, but I chose a, a, a text by Malarmé that he never finished, which was a series of fragments, and it hadn't been translated before to my knowledge. I realized then, after I'd finished it, that it already had been translated, otherwise I wouldn't have done it. Um, but I, I felt that I was greatly helped by a sense that I was writing a translation of Malarmé for an audience that was somehow intellectually calibrated for the particular kinds of difficulty that, that Malarmé brings. Um, I didn't feel I was writing, I didn't feel I was translating in a vacuum. Did uh, it, was it also Malarmé for, not just for a particular audience, but for a particular moment? I mean, are you, I mean I'm going to ask Oliver the same question, I think, whether you're aware of translating for now. I mean, inevitably, you are doing it, but whether that's something you're conscious of. Uh, consciously or unconsciously, I think that's what one does anyway. Um, I was yeah. interested um, in, the, I think it's the, the recent vintage translation of Madame Bovary by Adam Thorpe, where he translated Madame Bovary using only English words that had appeared before the publication of mm. Madame Bovary. And I think, having read that, um, extracts of it, it seems to me to work incredibly well. But if you introduce the right kind of velleity and anachronism and the right kind of lack of nowness, you could actually hit a peculiar kind of nowness by kind of circumventing <laughs> the process. You can tell I'm an academic when I say things like that. <laughs> I don't mean to be. To I think there's a way of. I think of there's nowness. a way of rejoining. I forgot what it was. I think there's a we, there's a way of rejoining your moment mm. um, culturally by going through a series of back routes, and I think that good translations can do that. Presumably, Oliver, this, this, is, this must be true to some extent with your Dostoevsky, though the difference is, of course, that, as you said, there are a dozen preceding it, that presumably we can look at yours compared to something done 20, 40, 60 years ago. And one of the things, there'll be many things that are different because you will notice different things and write different things, but part of it is going to be things that one can actually pin down to, this is a 2014 Dostoevsky, and 30 years from now it will look like a 2014 Dostoevsky. I'm sure that's true. Um but as Patrick says, this is going to happen whether or not one wants to. And I think that you've brilliantly formulated how it is that nowness comes into a translation anyway. And I, I followed a similar principle in the, in the sense that I tried not to use, I use the OED a lot simply in order not to, to try not to use words, phrases that had come into English after about the 1950s, 1960s. <laughs> the novel was written in the 1860s, so that's already a big difference. But I didn't want to use words that really had a very, very hyper-modern resonance in that way. But on the other hand, a translator starts off with, at such a disadvantage from the author that I think you want to keep your options as open as possible. And <laughs> um, especially, you know, Dostoevsky's Russian, although Russians probably wouldn't agree, to me, to a large extent, still sounds very modern. And of course, there is deliberate archaism in it as well. And so you want to keep your options open in order to be able to make that contrast between to, to, to replicate the contrast that's in the original, mm -hmm. where there is archaism and where there is modern speech. So, and sorry, I don't think we should be too neurotic about it. I think we need to keep the options open. And um, th th there are things that as a translator one needs to deliberate about a great deal, but perhaps where exactly one is pitching the register is not something that we, we should be too obsessive about, because I think that can be damaging. Although it's, it does seem to be the question first people first question people ask. Mm. Are you writing in the language of today or the language of Dostoevsky's time? Which I think is a false question because translators aren't ventriloquists and we can't suddenly turn on our inner Dickens and start <laughs> spooling, out, spooling out Victorian sentences or whatever. Um, but that in itself, even if, even if you couldn't, as it were, you couldn't fake it, the fact that you can't doesn't mean that there is a different relationship between um, people who are reading Dostoevsky now.
uh, in English and people now who are reading Dostoevsky in Russian. I mean, one of the examples people always oh, give is people, if you see Shakespeare in performance in translation, audiences almost always have, there is a much more direct connection to audiences now who are seeing him in other languages because they have absolute access to this thing where there is no vocabulary, which is strange. There are no archaic, uh, what seem in English to us to be archaisms. I mean, John, I wonder whether when you're commissioning a translation and when you're editing translations of these books that have been written sometime in the past, whether you're clear about what you want from your translator, whether this is something you discuss, and whether whether the kind of English into which it's being translated, to what extent you you will allow for um, a particular kind of positioning, if you like, of the... Um, generally not. It's, it's usually implicit in the hire. If I hire someone, then I'm <clears throat> there's an implicit trust in the approach, and the approach is something that um, I would ask the translator to envision or to um, spell out for us as a you know in order for us to properly consider the prospect of a new translation what is the argument what is the rationale mm. and what is the approach um, and then you know we'll either commission a sample or we'll proceed on the basis of the translator's previous work um, uh, so I, I, I try not to be too prescriptive because I want to give the translator a degree of uh, creative freedom, um, but it would be irresponsible of me, you know, to just kind of pick a translator's name out of a hat and say we need a new so and so. And I'd it? like it translated into 1954 yes. <laughs> right. North Dakota, please. right? Uh, and then in editing it, of course, you know, I'm, I'm reading it just to kind of make sure it strikes me as good English and to make sure that there's nothing glaringly, you know, there's nothing jarring about it, there's nothing glaringly wrong, glaringly inappropriate, um, uh, you know, or out of, out of register. Um, but I'm not uh, taking a scholarly approach mm. to it. Um, what happens then, though? You get your translation, you have to, having edited this, you have to sell it. Is, it, is, it, is selling, I mean, marketing and selling it a classic, because you since you're commissioning both classics and, and acquiring new work, is that process very different, how you actually package and sell a writer who's been dead for 100 years, a book that has been, is being translated maybe for the first time? Yeah, I mean, uh, with the classics, you're, off, you're often selling the translation. With a contemporary book, your chance would be a fine thing, yes. Uh, yeah, you're, you're kind of trying to hide the fact in <laughs> that it's a translation, or yeah. not at least draw attention to the fact that it's a translation. Yeah, um, you know, especially in a case where there are any number of other editions to choose from, our our our, the, our claim of being able to offer something new and something of value is that we have the best translation. So you're selling the Lydia Davis yeah. Madame Bovary. You're not selling Flaubert, wh whom you've bought already. Right. Actually, <laughs> Patrick, I want to ask you about Campanu and about. This is a writer who didn't exist in an English form until you uh, made his English voice for him. Can you say something about uh, the, the creation of this English voice? Yeah, um, <clears throat> one of the things that I have been reminded of listening to uh, today's discussion is that translations always have very different um, purposes in the host culture anyway. So whereas something like Madame Bovary now might be the kind of general improvement and extension of our reader, readerly horizons, there are other cases in which specific writers might have had a totally culturally differently um, important role. So I'm thinking of Edgar Allan Poe in France, you know, and the French absolutely loved Poe, mostly as far as I can tell, because they didn't really understand him. And what I mean by that is that they translated him into a very strange, almost non-French French. Mallarmé was very proud of having translated Poe into something that approximated French but wasn't French. Mm. And when somebody said to him, this isn't French, he said, well, you know, Poe doesn't really write in English. Um, mm. And clearly the job of the translation there was not to kind of provide the best version of a book for a particular culture. It was to use a particular writer, his image, and what that writer 
did and dealt in um, for particular cultural purposes, namely um, inspiring, um, inspiringly deforming Poe for the purposes of late 19th century French poetry. And in fact, one of the French writers, when he finally learned English, and then he said, you know, I'm going to learn English so I can read this wonderful Poe I've been reading in French. And he read Poe and he said, gosh, it's not very good, is it? I preferred him in the original French. So you've got this strange flip whereby the host culture ends up owning a particular writer, doing things with it that the, um, the source culture um, doesn't do with him. And um, that seemed to me very interesting. That's a very long way round of saying that a few years ago when I was writing a book of poetry, I felt that I had exhausted myself um, in proprio persona, um, and I decided to invent a poet that I might be translating from, and this poet was called Liviu Campanu. And um, by inventing Campanu, I realized that beginning fictionally, I gave him a biography, a few little dramas, um, some general erotic hankerings, but nothing explicit. Mm -hmm. And I began to write some poems as if they had been translated. And I tried to work into the translations the sense of translatedness, that weird kind of matness that you get, um, as opposed to the shininess. Um, whether I was successful or not, I don't know. But what people said when the book came out was, yep, the McGuinness poems, it's the usual stuff. But this Campanu, he's the real thing. And, and I thought, well, actually, Campanu sort of is the real thing because he enabled me to find new ways of being myself by, by inventing a poet. And um, it wasn't in any way a hoax. It was really an extension of a process that I think is implicit, first of all, in writing poetry, and secondly, actually, in the, in the business of translating poetry. I don't mean prose. Uh, or proper books, as my son calls them. I mean specifically poetry where the translator's liberty is, as it were, already written in to, um, into the act, into the process. Um, and I suppose I also felt quite challenged by the depressing fact to me as a linguist, so-called, that many of the best translations of foreign poets such as Rilke, for example, are done by people who don't speak the original language. And I think to myself, here I am slogging away at learning languages so I can read stuff, and someone who doesn't know the language comes and turns out these beautiful poems. What's going on? And again, I thought that I would circumvent the process by just inventing a whole new poet and then writing some poems. Um, so yeah, I feel like I translated Campanu, but I'm in a kind of postmodern situation now where I have a Romanian translator who is now <laughs> finding, who is now producing originals, as it were, to um, post-date my translations and so on. It's like being in a these, Borges These have story. to be originals which are shiny rather than matte. They presumably. have to be really shiny. They have to yes. be absolutely yes. shiny. So you know originals. they're originals. That's a thankless task, isn't it? But there's the sense in, in, in po yes, yes, there's a sense in poetry that um, when you're translating, it's like the effect of photocopying photocopies. You know, you know it's a translation because it's slightly blurry, because it's slightly matte. There's a bit of flick, flecks of dust, you know, on the. I mean, it kind of on degrades the paper. slightly in each, yeah, each stage. Yeah, that's right. Of Perpetual kind of degradation, which sometimes you can enjoy and sometimes not. Um, but when, for example, I read Don Patterson's versions of, uh, of Vilka's Orpheus, um, I see pure shine. Um, and I wonder why. And then I think to myself, it's because he doesn't know any German. And then I get depressed. <laughs> I'm not sure what the moral of that is, though. But it's, 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 not, it's not anything good, definitely. No, no, <laughs> it's not good. Uh, we have about 15 minutes for questions. There were lots of other things I was going to. And we have questions here very quickly. Excellent. All right. Uh, Yes, Becky, and then Antonia. There is a microphone somewhere. <coughs> microphone just coming to the front here. Becky, and then. Um, so I, I have a question about something that several of you sort of hit on. Um, on April 1st, I think Penguin posted on Facebook a hoax, obviously, about a new imprint that was called Now! Penguin Exclamation now. Point, yes. And it was about reinterpreting classics uh, with, with urgency. And I found this idea really funny, um, and I was thinking about it in terms of translation, translating classics, and um, uh, in a non-funny way, obviously. 
but I, I, I wanted to know, is there space in prose translation of classics for um, a sort of, uh, like what you're saying, sort of making, taking liberties of something that, uh, reinterpreting it so that the translator is also in part kind of an author um, I'm and has that license that Patrick talked about in relation to yeah, poetry. Yeah, I'm thinking of the, that remake of the Shakespeare, uh, Romeo and Juliet, was it um, Baz, Baz Luhrmann? Luhrmann um, sort of a radical reinterpretation of something. Is, is there a space for that in the prose? Is it done? I'm, I'm not familiar with it. For those of you who didn't see this thing, it, the, the story was, there's an imprint called Penguin Now, exclamation mark, and it was going to be re-releasing classics with for a new generation, every sentence was going to end with an exclamation mark. <laughs> so there were examples, for example, of, uh, of L'Etranger, which began, Mother died today, exclamation mark. <laughs> or maybe yesterday, I'm not sure, exclamation mark. <laughs> the entire thing was like this. It was, it was quite wonderful. Um, I'll start with John, then, as a publisher. Do you feel like there is scope for someone to do a translation which has a certain kind of, there's something different, something which is creative in a different way? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think, um, well... Either uh, the term translation has an elasticity that can accommodate this, or you might um, call it something like a retelling. So um, I published um, Philip Pullman's fairy tales from the Brothers Grimm, and those weren't strict translations. They were really his retellings. Um, you know, uh, uh, Hogarth Press, part of Random House, um, have recently embarked on a program to uh, invite big name authors to kind of retell the, the plays of Shakespeare. Um, so they've just cho they've just tapped Yo Nesbo to retell Macbeth. You know, I don't know. Does that do you consider that a Ma translation? Margaret Atwood is doing the Tempest. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and I'm interested in that kind of thing. Um, uh, you know, and I've got ideas, but I don't know that that would fall under translation. I mean, I, you'd have to really ask the translators whether they whether they can flex their muscles enough in that way. Well, it's partly um, a question of whether you call it a translation. It's also whether, a question of whether the people you commission to do it are translators, because the people who are doing, the people at Hogarth Press are commissioning to do these things. There's some really interesting people on the list, but they are not Anthea Bell and Margaret Jo Costa. They are people whose job is to do what might be considered proper writing as opposed to the thing we do which is somehow uh, other than that I mean Oliver would you feel I'm not going to I'm not going to go there uh, Oliver do you feel like there's scope for what you when you're translating to do to, there's scope for it to be um, a different kind of representation of the people you're translating I certainly hope so, otherwise it would be rather a futile exercise. And no, I mean, I think uh, any translator's fingerprints are all over the translation, but mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a mystery that's quite hard to fathom exactly ha how a, a translator's personality imbues a translation, but it undoubtedly happens. I think, I think that the simplification is to think that that needs to happen at the level of some sort of radical, as you say, mm -hmm. reinvention of the text, which, which veers towards some kind of adaptation. It's not about that. It's about the small decisions in a, in a, in a in a way. I mean, there's a, lot, there's a lot in Crime and Punishment. Dostoevsky is fascinated by people lying and um, making, um, and he says, uh, you know, one of the characters says, we, we, we should lie our way to the truth. And I think that if Dostoevsky was analyzing a translation, he would look at all the lies that a translator commits, by which I mean, you know, now as translators, we're all encouraged to give our sort of credo at the beginning, to give a translator's note and to say what our principles are. Mm. But Dostoevsky, with his, with his type of mind, would then be looking for how actually you're contradicting, you're contradicting your own stated principles all the way through a translation. And actually, I certainly do that. So you might say, I'm going to preserve all of the repetitions. But then actually, if you analyzed it closely, you would see at, in that way, you might begin to see how a translator is shaping the text um, in a very personal and subjective way. So I would look more for the minuscule, apparently, apparently minuscule reshapings to actually get the bigger picture of how, how, how one ultimately arrives at a very different representation. Patrick's done almost the opposite by creating a text in his own way by eliminating the original entirely and therefore doing something which is either the, the most free or the least free translation depending on how you look at it. Well, yeah, you're the most free but because you've got nothing to obey but in also you're the least free because you're most yourself and most caught up and bounded in, in 
in what you're doing. So it, it goes bo both ways. Um, yeah, I, the, there are boundaries, of course, between translations, versions, and adaptations, but they're only porous things, really, aren't they? They're differences of degree rather than kind of checkpoints um, that are policed by some kind of translation customs. Um, I think we need that. I think we're going to set up a translation custom. I think board, probably, border control, study yeah, at Warston, saying, no, nope, uh, that shelf. Yeah, and a sort of currency exchange, too. I've always felt that about translating, that I was actually changing money, you know, that you may not mm. get the same amount back as you put in, or that you can buy different stuff with it. And there's also the, the possibility that the Bureau de Change will also take its commission. So you, you're dealing with something really mobile and about which it's very hard to make any rules. And just from my own experience, when I'm sitting down translating something, it doesn't matter how many translation theories I've read, how many seminars I've done on translation, how many classes I've done with my students about translation. In the end, it's just you and the text and all kinds of strange and often really hard to fathom rationally um, decisions and judgments and states of mind that, that, that are going on inside yourself. But also, at a certain point, it's you without the text, isn't as it? As well, because yes. I, mean, I think probably most translators have to set, have to set the original aside at a certain point yeah. in, their, in their work. Yeah. Uh, these kinds of liberties are easier to take with, you know, authors, uh, with authors whose work is, is out of copyright. And, you know, I could look at, mm. you know, uh, Peter Bush's translation of the um, 16th century Celestina. Spanish kind of proto-novel uh, La Celestina, um, in, in, and I hope I'm not misrepresenting it here because I haven't seen the original, but I believe that there's a kind of paratext there you know, that presents it almost as uh, 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 on the page as uh, the way a, a play would look um, you know, with mm. speaker uh, indexes. Um, and he stripped those out and presented it as as, as a novel, um, and uh, you know, an, um, a kind of a somewhat more a different a different approach would be Anne Carson, the poet Anne Carson's um, uh, translations of um, of Sappho and of the of the the ancient Greek playwrights. I mean, her uh, approach is a kind of radical reimagining, and it's it's kind of a work of of original poetry more than it's a strict translation, um, and I think there's a there's a place for that. There's a readership for that. Um, you know, over time there may be a kind of um, uh, that might be accepted in the academy as a teaching text. But I, I suspect that um, you know, in the academic world, a, a more con conventional, mm -hmm. um, straight translation. Um, with but it's also, it's also about pedagogically. It's also about what you call it and what you, how you acknowledge it. Presumably, Peter's translation of La Celestina does somewhere say in a forward and afterward and note or whatever, by the way, I have done these things so that you know that what you're getting is has been changed, has been re reformed or re recast in a different it's way. Mo somehow. It's most transparent when you can have a dual language presentation. Um, you know, a, 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 most often in the case of poetry, you know, I published an, an edition, a new translation of the Song of the Cid, and you know, the, the lines really didn't match up at all, you know, and there were great liberties taken, and I, you know, I think the translation really worked as a, as a kind of narrative. Uh, Antonia had a question. Uh, it's two questions. Firstly, um, if an author is too dead to appear at literary festivals without offending people, um, and also has a name that is totally unfamiliar outside his own country and totally unpronounceable, how do you market him? And my second question is, has Campanu been translated back into French? Uh, so how do, you, how do you market, how do you send someone who's been dead for 150 years on the road to Edinburgh? Um, presumably, it's part of the answer, I mean, I suppose Oliver and Patrick is part of the answer that the translator has to become a sort of ambassador for the book. Is part of your job to be to be Dostoevsky for the purposes of being in public. Dostoevsky is not with us today, as you will have noticed, but we have even better. We have the English Dostoevsky. So presumably there is some part of that answer which is 
it's the translator's job. Not just the translator. I mean, Dostoevsky doesn't lack uh, <coughs> supporters. Mm. And, you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury took time out from his controversial position to write a book on Dostoevsky. And um, I was very glad that he agreed to do one of the launches with me of, of, of mm. Crime and Punishment, even though it was very clear that this was far from his favorite Dostoevsky novel, because mm. he kept wanting to talk about devils uh, or <laughs> demons or the possessed. <laughs> It's so, an occupational hazard, one might think. Which he thinks is a very, very funny novel. Uh, <laughs> so uh, intermediaries are, 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 are a good way, I think, of representing a... I think it works much better than just the translator who's obviously trying to sell. <laughs> if you have a conversation with um, a contemporary critic or a public intellectual, I think that brings people in. <clears throat> I think there are cases where certain writers become advocates for the people that they're translating, that that works very well. I'm thinking um, of Michael Hoffman, the, the poet, who's been translating Josef Roth, for example, and um, has been clearly responsible for maybe for upping Roth's um, status in our, in our consciousness. but. Um, it would be sad to have to depend on individuals, and it seems to me that a kind of receptive and organic and self-perpetuating culture for translation doesn't really exist, and a lot of it seems to be accidental, really. Receptivity seems to be accidental, or at least it's triggered by something and then other things come in on the flow of it. Um, the most obvious analogy is the the craze for Scandinavian detective fiction, which I remember starting uh, with Henning Mankell um, in my consciousness about 20 years ago and is now, is now an enormous phenomenon. But um, how you do that with dead people, other than v murder victims, I mean, uh, dead mm. authors who have died of natural causes, I don't know. Um, but, but, but it does happen, but only in a small way, and I don't think there's any grounds to be especially optimistic or ambitious about it's happening in a big way. Campanu, incidentally, has been translated occasionally into French and also into Hungarian. I, I'm, I'm assuming you can't read Hungarian. I'm I assuming. can't, no, no. But you could nonetheless translate it, it back from Hungarian. It probably isn't Campanu. They're probably pay, playing a, playing a post-postmodern trick on me. And this idea of an author who is going to be hard to sell completely unheard of, extremely dead and with a, you know, a funny unpronounceable name, um, as all of our friends are in fact writers with unpronounceable names. Um, presumably, Alexandra is part of the process of finding, of helping people to find these things. You're depending on, I mean, there, there is a role for translators in this. There's a role for publishers. I mean, I wonder if you could say something maybe about the process of the, 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 the organizations that are in Schwab go through the people who are involved in the process of actually identifying these these dead people <laughs> of all of of all of the many many dead writers who haven't been translated with funny names, um, the, the process of actually selecting and kind of uh, filtering to a kind of useful number. Well, it's um, it's it's obviously it's not an objective choice or anything. Fun fun. It's it's really a question of. Um, what we like, fun fun in the end, fun fun what we think is good, fun fun and, but it, most of the times it starts with the translators who tell us about titles that we haven't heard about. And um, then we try to get samples of that um, title in the original or in a translation that we can read, fun fun, um, or if there is no translation um, in, a, in a language that we can read, we ask somebody to make it or to read the original fun and tell us more about it. So that way fun fun we we have more and more opinions and um, and if we read it ourselves and fun we are trying to right now fun we are six partners and we meet twice a year and we are trying to bring in each of us five titles each time and we just read all of them and then we get together and we discuss those titles for days and we come up with 10 titles that we think those could be really interesting and we put them on the website and we tell publishers about it. And, 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 can, you, and you, can you track the success? I mean you can see things, yes. publishers being interested in taking, like, discovering things. For example, things. there was just now a month ago a publication of the Danish um, book Niels Lüne by Jens Peter Jakobsen von der 
which is a it's a tiny book, fun fun, and it's been like the favorite book of quite a few German writers of the beginning of the 20th century, like Thomas Mann, Rilke, Stefan Zweig. Um, and the last translation of this book into Dutch was um, 60 years back, I think, from in the 40s. And it hasn't been available, and nobody knew about it really anymore, fun fun. And it's been available in German, in English, in French. And we just thought, well, it's a, it's a very... It's, it's really, it's a beautiful little book, fun, fun, and it's just such a pity that you can't read it in Dutch anymore. And we talked about that a year ago with a, um, and, and that was a book that the translator came up with. And um, when we talked with a publisher about it, it turned out that the editor himself thought, this is one of my favorites. But it's, and, and that you encounter so often with publishers. They, they have, they run around with a lot of books where they think, yeah, but this won't sell. Fun, fun, so I can't do it. Fun, fun, so it's, it's, it's more like try to find the publisher who really loves this book anyway. And as soon as you mention it, very often it happens that he says, well, very nice of you mentioning it. Fun, fun, now I'm really considering doing it as mm. well. Fun, fun, so that's, that's really what happened in this case. And now they published it and it got very nice reviews and um, it's going well. Fun, so, um, so I really, my, my impression, I'm, I'm working on this project now for three years, is that it's very often, um, it's, a, it's a kind of preconception that we have of dead writers, especially when they are unfamiliar, that this is a lost case, don't start on it. Fun it is, and I think it's just not true. It's something that we tell ourselves. Fun fun, and, um, and I really think that many publishers especially started into this business because they read books that they really love and that they thought, um, these are the books that I want to publish. And um, it's often books by dead writers. And, um, and it's not always the big names because mm -hmm. you start with the big names mostly and then you kind of figure out like who are the writers around that big name, fun, fun. And then you figure out, fun, wow, this is wonderful. And it's really about this digging and um, finding. And I think that a lot of fun in that is, is the same that you have as a reader when you go through a bookstore and you just think, oh, have a look at this, fun, fun, fun. And, um, and I think it's more, um, th that's the way how you can get this kind of titles to readers. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you trigger that c sense of fun in, in curiosity, mm -hmm. um, really. Um, it's, re it's reassuring to be told that it isn't a lost cause because that is certainly part of, that, uh, part of the narrative we get, which is, as Antonio was saying, it's harder, even with someone who's translated but alive, if they can't come and promote the book, if they can't do festivals, if they can't speak on the radio, if they're not available to, to you know, do a road show or to shill for the work, um, that somehow it's going to be difficult. And it's, it's pleasing to know that this is not necessarily the case. Uh, let's have one may, very may quick last question. Yeah. Very shortly about yeah. that, from, because we're planning now, from, from we, I, I've been talking with Dutch publishers for a year now, from, from how, can we, how can we bring these kind of titles that most people have never heard about from, from into the focus? And um, well, we're gonna do quite a few things, but one of them is also we send around, a, we call it the bus with publishers, from, from so like um, send the publishers around the bookstores and ask them from how do you how do you look for this kind of titles how did you find this one how was it to get the rights from fun um, and why do you publish this and also to ask publishers not only to talk about the titles they publish but to talk about each other's titles because very often it's it's this group of titles that we have quite a few examples where for the same title we had several publishers trying to get the rights, and, and those are not like the latest hype or the best sellers, fun, fun, um, but it's really titles that um, publishers like. So it's, I think what is the base of that project is that um, publishers talk about books they, are do, they do not because they think they're gonna earn a lot of money, and I think that um, that is quite convincing for readers as well to listen to. So that was the last thing. Thanks. Thank you, uh, we'll have a very quick last question. Hello. Um, it's not in the perspective of this you know, publisher, um, because publisher has to attract the attention of the readership and all that. In terms of a translator, when we translate a classic into modern language, do you think you know, a translator can be, I mean, he can be self-satisfactory for that? And can, I mean, can, I mean, does he justify his work translating classical language into modern one? We talked a little bit about that earlier. Presumably this is something which, I mean, Oliver, you're saying you can't, Presumably you don't sort of make 
and then how to phrase this. You don't kind of make a decision about that. I mean, you 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 uh, sort of you don't create a policy. You know, you, you translation you, you use translation is not just a sentence of the word. You're translating culture into mm. another culture. I mean, I suppose that also leads to a whole other thing which we haven't talked about, which is how you create not just the, tra the translation itself, but you create an edition which is including notes and an introduction, how you kind of present this thing, how you present your translation, not just as a text, but as a, as a, a thing for, for access to yeah. readers now, if I understand you rightly. Very briefly, I mean, we did, we did touch on this subject. All, I, all I'd add is uh, I didn't try to write into the language of, of now. Uh, but I had certain principles about where I would, I would, didn't want to use language that had just entered the, Eng the English language in the last 30 or 40 years. And I did have what Russian translation, translators would call tuning forks. I mean, I did read a a Edgar Allan Poe, I did read some other writers who I felt were on a similar wavelength to Dostoevsky in English. But in the end, the, the editors who read my translation commented on how modern it sounded. So. I think a lot of the translation process happens at a level that translators can't actually control in any case, and the effect of their translation, they're not best placed to judge mm. either. So if it comes across sounding modern, fine by me, but that's probably not what I aimed for, particularly. <coughs> I'm afraid we are, we are running a few minutes late. We are going to have to stop. The, the previous session also ran late, so now we're going to run late, but everything is going to be late forever yeah. from now on. <laughs> Some, so, someone said once, Think about Henry Kissinger, that he was 15 minutes late for a meeting in the 60s and never caught up. So this is what we're doing now. The next session's going to be late, and we're just stuck with it forever. Uh, thank you for being a lovely audience. Before you go, please join me in thanking our brilliant panel, Patrick McGuinness, John Alexander Coffin, Oliver Reddy. Thank you.